It's a pleasure for me to be here at Stanford and give this talk in person. And so, as Jeanette said, I'm an assistant professor at USC where I direct the ICAROS lab, Interactive and Collaborative, Collaborative Autonomous Robotic Systems lab. And when I studied at USC, I wanted to find an application of uh, the robots that we have in the lab that uh, actually is useful and has an impact on people. And so I went to a facility with uh, post-stroke patients, and I asked them, if you have a robotic arm like this one that we have in the lab, what would you like the arm to do? And people said things like, I would like the arm to help me eat, meal preparation. But uh, what uh, really made an impression on me was uh, a lady that, uh, and she told me that she would like this robotic arm to help uh, her comb her hair. And that's an, that's an interesting application because it's not uh, something that you need um, for survival, but it has an important self-image and um, uh, self-image aspect. And so I said, okay, what can we do to make this system uh, a hair combing system? And so we uh, implemented uh, a system with a Kinect. The Kinect uh, 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 detects a person's hair, builds a mesh, adapts it to a given hairstyle, and then we use that mesh to plan a path, to plan a constraint path with a robot arm, and uh, comb the person's hair. And so we can, this way, we can like have different combing strategies for different hairstyles. And then I said, okay, we have this system in the lab and it, it worked very robustly. What do we need to do to actually move that system from the lab to the real world? And in a sense, in order to do that, we should be able to account for the different undesirable behaviors that may occur. So for example, what happens if the user raises their arms? Well, for that case, what we did is we built um, uh, a skin conductance sensor on the comp so that as soon as it gets in touch with the skin, the robot will stop as a safety mechanism. But there are many, many undesirable behaviors and many, many different things that can go wrong that we should account for if we want to deploy this system for a, for a large amount of time like with real users. And so our thesis is that robust human-robot interaction requires identifying and accounting for different undesirable behaviors. And one way to do that would be through user studies. And I've spent my entire career doing user studies. But there is a limited number of user behaviors and environments that you can cover in a user study. And so instead, especially as these systems become more and more complex and less and less transparent, you want to somehow be able to systematically test these systems. And so the question that we are going to ask is, can we automatically generate scenarios that test uh, and find failure cases for complex HRI systems? And so as, as an example application, we, you, we will use the shared autonomy via hindsight optimization uh, system. And in that system, the robot uses, the robot runs a partially observable Markov decision process, a PAMDP, uses the user inputs through a joystick interface as observations, infers what the user's goal is among a candidate set of different goals, and then assists the user for that goal. So that's the shared autonomy system. That's a system that we will try to find failure scenarios. So a success case of that system is shown here where there are two goal objects. The user wants to go to the left object, the T. It points to the left with a joystick. The system uses a joystick input as observations, infers that the user wants to go to the black T, and helps the user give that goal. And this is a very robust system. So we actually went to Kinova Robotics. Uh, uh, I, I, so we had this system uh, during my PhD studies. We went to Kinova Robotics, and we tested with axial spinal core injury patients. And it worked very, very robustly for a number of users. And I said, OK, can we generate scenarios in simulation that result in system failures? Now, what is a scenario in shared autonomy? A scenario in that case would be moving objects around, but also simulating user inputs. And so we will try in simulation to find different human input sequences and also different object locations that result in failures. Now, one, op one approach would be to formulate that uh, as a single objective optimization problem where you try to find a global optimum, where the global optimum minimizes the shared autonomy system's performance. But this, the scenario that you would come up if you try to do that would be a scenario where the user is maximally adversarial or deceptive. And these scenarios that, that are global optima are pretty easy to find and they are not very interesting. Instead, what we would like to have is we want to have a diverse range of challenging scenarios. Scenarios where the user is optimal, but also scenarios where the user is noisy. Scenarios where the scene is cluttered, but also scenarios where the, scene is, where the objects in the scene are spread out. And when we were trying to actually search for a diverse range of high-quality solutions, we found out that there is actually an entire community or sub-community that 
focuses on this problem, on finding diverse solutions. And that's a quality diversity problem. And so in single objective optimization, you typically have one objective and you try to find a global optimum. In multi-objective optimization, you have two or more objectives and you search for a Pareto front. Diversity-driven search does not care about objectives, but tries to fill in a space specified by measure functions. So it tries to find a solution for every output combination of the two or more measure functions. Quality diversity has an objective that wants to maximize, but also it has one or more measure functions, which are the measures of diversity, and form a space that you want to fill in. And so formally, we assume an objective and some measures, and this form a measure space. And the quality diversity objective is to, for every output combination of the measure functions, find the solution and the quality of that solution be maximized. And so we want to find a collection of solutions that fill in the measure space that are as high quality as possible. Now, to solve that problem, you would need infinite memory because the measure space is continuous. And so what state-of-the-art quality diversity algorithms do is they use an approximate objective where the space is tessellated. So essentially what they do is we partition the space to cells and then we try to fill in as many cells as possible with solutions of as high quality as possible. A state-of-the-art quality diversity algorithm is map elites. The idea behind map elites is you have a high dimensional search space. These are the scenario parameters. And you map this to a lower dimensional measure space where the measures are the measures of diversity that you care about, is the functions that you want to have an output for every output combination of these functions. And you want to find solutions that fill in that space, but also the quality is as high as possible. And the way map elites works is that it retains an archive of best performers. So it keeps track for every cell, what is the solution that has performed the best so far, and then if it finds a better solution, it discards the previous one and replaces it with a new solution. Also, if a new solution finds an empty cell in the archive, it adds that solution to the archive. So it keeps track of an archive of elites, hence the name, of the best performers so far. And so the way it works is that first you sample some initial solutions from a fixed distribution and you populate the archive. And then you iteratively select these elites, solutions from the archive, and you perturb them a little bit. So you apply some perturbation with an isotropic Gaussian and you generate new solutions. And the insight here is that existing solutions can be used as stepping stones. So existing high-performing solutions are likely, with some perturbation, to generate new high-performing solutions in other parts of the archive. So this is how map elites works, right? It tries to find an archive of solutions, solutions that are diverse with respect to some measures of diversity. And we said, can we actually apply map elites to generate scenarios for the shared autonomy domain? And what we varied, the measures of diversity, was distance between objects. So intuitively, the more cluttered the scene, the harder for the robot will be to disambiguate between the two objects. And also, we varied the amount of variation from the optimal path. How noisy the human is. And again, intuitively, the noisier the user, the harder for the robot it would be to understand what the user intent is. And we said, OK, can we generate a diverse range of scenarios that result in system failure? So the quality, the quality that we want to maximize is a is to minimize performance of the shared autonomy system, right? So we want the HRI system to fail. And so this is, if you run map elites on that, you get an archive of solutions. So this is a resulting archive where the x-axis is the amount of variation, the total amount of noise, so variation from the optimal path. So as you go to the right, you have a noisier human. The y-axis is distance between two objects. Each cell here represents a scenario and the color represents performance. So red color indicates a maximum system timeout where the shared autonomy system was unable to reach the user's goal uh, for the pre-specified time limit. So it's a red, go red color indicates that the system has failed, right? It's a failure scenario. OK, so we get an archive of solutions. The first question to ask is, how does Map Elite work? And how does it compare to uniformly sampling the, the, the scenario parameters? So what if uniformly sample like object locations and human inputs? Can we generate diverse scenarios this way? And we see that map elites generates more diverse scenarios, but also more failure scenarios. Why this is the case? The, the reason behind that is a phenomenon called the measure space distortion, where the idea is the following. If you sample a high dimensional search space and map this to a lower dimensional measure space, you get, a measure, you get the samples to concentrate on a small region. 
So let me give you an example. If you uniformly place objects on a table, you get diversity with respect to object positions, but what if you care about the uh, distances between two objects? The probability that all objects are maximally distance, distant becomes very, very small if you uniform sample objects. The probability that they are all very close to each other is very, very small. And you can actually show from properties of random vectors that the sample distances are all concentrated on a very small region. And so even though you get diversity with respect to objects positions, you don't get diversity with respect to the lower dimensional metric that you care about. And this happens in many, many domains where you map a high dimensional scenario space to a lower dimensional feature space. And this is why map elites works better than random search in that case, because it takes existing solutions from the archive, perturbs them a little bit, and then uses the existing solutions to populate the archive as much as possible. It also performs better than covariance metrics adaptation evolution strategy, CMAS, which is a state-of-the-art derivative-free optimizer. And that's expected because CMAS tries to find a single global optimum instead of a diverse range of high-quality solutions. Okay, and we can also, like this qualitative difference that you see, we can also compute a quality diversity score, which is the, a metric that summarizes diversity and quality of solutions, and we can see that it performed better than all the baselines. But I think what is really interesting is to see what these failures look like. So if we have this HRI system and we try to find these scenarios and we reproduce them in the real world, how do they look like? Why the system fails? So this is a success case where the system works well. Let's try to see a failure cases. So a failure case here, this one selected here, is a case where there is a large amount of variation from the optimal path. So the user is very, very noisy. Well, if we reproduce this in the real world, it looks something like that. So the noise here is a jerking motion to the right, and the system gets confused and thinks that the user wants to go to the white object instead of the black T and gets stuck there. That's not very surprising. If there is noise in user inputs and the system uses the user inputs as observations, the system will get confused. What was really surprising is that we found failure cases even for a nearly optimal user. So even if the user provides, based on some rationality metric, the optimal input sequence, the system will still fail. If we reproduce this scenario in the real world, we get this object configuration. And what happens is that the system uses a distance-based observation function. And even though the user optimally points to the right object, to the object that they want to go, which is the black T um, uh, at the back, the system still thinks that the user wants to go to the white object because it's closer and gets stuck there. And this is an interesting edge case that when manually testing the system, we were just moving objects around and we had not observed, but it was discovered by this uh, uh, quality diversity scenario generation algorithm. And so the overall insight that we got from this work is that quality diversity algorithm can outperform baselines in finding diverse failure cases uh, to test human robot interaction systems. So we sent this work and it was accepted to RSS and we were very happy about it, but reviewers came back with two very legitimate concerns. And one is that first, MapElist still requires a very large number of iterations. So I don't know if any one of you has used ever OpenRave, but we had actually had, we had 100 OpenRave instances running in parallel in a many core machine for several hours. And so there is a high computational cost to explore the vast space, the vast continuous space of scenarios. Just a quick question. So for each point in the MapElist space time, one of those cells corresponds to many particular instantiations of the same measures. So for each, each point, there is one specific scenario. So it's an instantiation of the scenario parameters. So that is a specific human trajectory, human input trajectory, and a specific object location. Now the second limitation is that these scenarios are also pretty simple. It's just object locations. And so in the, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to address these two limitations and say how we can improve the efficiency of searching the scenario space, but also how can we generate more complex scenes, more complex scenarios. How does MapElites work? So MapElites selects uniformly solutions from the archive and applies an isotropic Gaussian. An implicit assumption when applying this random perturbation is that every direction is equally promising. That, that's what an isotropic noise means. So can we instead do better? Can instead ge generate solutions in the direction of maximizing the quality diversity objective, which is to find solutions that fill in the archive as much as possible, but also solutions that are as high quality as possible. 
So instead of applying a noise that is isotropic, and where e every direction is equally likely, can we search for a solution that maximizes archive improvement, that fills in the archive as, as, as fast as possible? So in a sense, what we would like to do is we would like to compute some sort of a gradient of the quality diversity objective with respect to the current archive and move in the direction of that gradient, move in the direction of steepest ascent. Now, what is a gradient? A gradient is a small perturbation that is in the direction of maximum improvement. How can we perturb the archive a little bit? Well, we do that either by adding a new solution or by replacing an existing solution with a new, better solution. And the key insight is that we search for that solution, that new solution that maximizes archive improvement, and we formulate that search as an optimization problem. And so we can use CMAS, Covariance Metrics Adaptation Evolution Strategy, and what the way CMAS works is that we have a multivariate Gaussian, we sample solutions, and then we select and rank them based on some objective metric, and then we update the mean and covariance metrics of that Gaussian. Now here what we do is we can use CMAS, but instead of selecting and ranking the solutions on some objective, we can select and rank solutions based on how much they, maxim how much they improve the archive and move in a direction that maximizes archive improvement. And if we do that, then if we combine these archiving properties of map elites with the selection and ranking properties of CMAS, we introduce a new algorithm called covariance metrics adaptation map elites, CMAME, and we were able to show that this actually performed much, much better in several benchmark domains. And one domain that we'll discuss is the Hearthstone. So Hearthstone is a very interesting game because uh, you select which move to play, but also you select which cards to have on the deck. So it's like learning how to play chess where you select uh, the strategy, but you also select which pieces to have on board. And we were used CMAME to search for diverse strategies. So here we don't search for scenarios, we just search for player strategies. And so the way to do that is we can represent a strategy as a neural network that ranks board states, and then we can optimize the neural network parameters with CMAME. So we do new revolution where we search for neural network parameters with CMAME. And the objective is to win as many games as possible, while the measures are average hand size, so how large the deck is, and average number of turns, how long the game is going to last. So we want to, have to find strategies that result in long games, but also short games, strategies that where the, the user, the player uses a large number of cards and a small number of cards. And if we do that, we see that compared to map elites, CMAME finds a much larger number of strategies, but also strategies that perform much better. So lighter color here indicates better performance. What is really interesting is that the x-axis here is number of turns, which is how long the game is going to last. And if we see how CMAME populates this archive, it starts first with strategies that last very little, very short amount of time, and then gradually starts finding strategies that will last longer, and then optimizes these strategies further. So it's like learning how to play chess where you first do fool's mate, but this can get you that far, and then you start trying to play the longer game and then gradually became, become better at it. So we see that the way we specify these measures of diversity and the way CMAME tries to cover this archive to with respect to these measures, also forms a natural curriculum that helps it find better performing strategies. Okay, so this part, and we can also see some quantitative metrics that show that perform much better than the baselines, and, but these parts uh, show that map elites can, that we can actually improve a lot the search efficiency of map elites to achieve good results. The second aspect is can we generate more complex scenarios? And one approach would be, to, would be to just add more objects in the scene. But that will generate complex scenes, but it's not exactly what we want, because we want scenes to be complex, but also realistic. Like if we were to, in a kitchen environment, we would like to, the pot to be on top of the stove and the fruit basket on top of the table, but not the fruit basket on top of the stove. So we want some realism in the scenes that we generate. And so the key insight here is that Instead of searching directly for environments, for object positions, we can search, we can train generative models with human authored examples, and then search, use quality diversity to search the latent space of these generative models. And in this way, we can generate diverse environments, 
that are also realistic because they match the style of the human authored examples that we use to train these generative models. And so in this example, we use the overcooked game domain. So in overcooked, there are two agents that try to perform a task as quickly as possible uh, and complete a meal preparation task. The green agent here is like a simulated robot agent, so runs a PAMDP, tries to infer what the human subtask is and adapt and help the human for that task. The blue agent is a simulated human, so it runs in some uh, simple rule-based heuristics. And so these two agents coordinate to complete the task. And the question that we are asking is, can we generate environments that are diverse with respect to coordination behaviors? Environments that lead to poor coordination, where a lot of agents remain idle, they get stuck, and environments that result in very high quality coordination. And so what we did is we took the quality diversity algorithm CMAME, we searched the latent space of a GAN, and then if we do that and we generate a level, that level will, be, will match the style of human authored examples, but it has artifacts. So the output of a GAN will match the training distribution, but you'll see that it has some parts of the layout here are not easily accessible, there are no pods, and so it's not a playable level, it's not an executable environment. And so what we do is we repair, we use a mixed integer program to repair the generated environment, where we minimize the number of edits between the input, the GAN generated environment, and the output environment, while respecting some playability constraints. So we can formulate this as a minimum cost network flow problem, where the objective is to minimize flow uh, in a special graph, while satisfying some constraints, for example, have a specific number of objects of each type, all parts being uh, reachable, and so on. And then we can simulate agents. We can evaluate some coordination metrics, concurrent motion, agent idle time, and do this iteratively so that we have diverse environments, diverse environments. And if we do that, we can see these are two example environments generated. So the environment on the left side is an environment where coordination is very, very good. So you see all objects are very easily accessible. All agents will move to the objects that are accessible and coordinate very well to do the task. The environment on the right, on the other hand, it has a long corridor. The two agents get stuck here. One agent has to wait. Now this agent has to wait for the other agent to move on and so on. It's also very intuitive because, you know, you see a long corridor here, you see a crossing. But in the environment generation process, there was nothing that said how the environment should look like. We only, the only measure of diversity was what is a concurrent motion? What is a percentage of concurrent motion? What is a percentage of the idle time of each agent? And so by generating environments that are diverse to these measures, we were able to uh, find environments that are human intuitive, but, and also result in diverse coordination metrics. We can also use the same pipeline to find failures. So if we try to minimize performance, you can see this environment here where this is a PAMDP agent and this is a human agent and they get stuck and the rule-based agent based on some heuristic starts performing random actions. But the result of that is that the PAMDP agent, the belief over the human subtask starts oscillating between two candidate tasks and therefore the two agents get stuck. And so this is a corner case based on the model of the PAMDP agent that was discovered from this environment generation pipeline. What is really exciting is that we then removed the simulated human and we had axial human users play the game. And we said, do these behaviors that we observed in simulation translate with real users? And the answer is yes. So the low team fluency layouts are layouts that um, in simulation had the coordination was poor. High team fluency are layouts where the, in simulation the coordination was very high. And you see the percentage of concurrent motion when we had axial human users in a user study play the game. And we see that for low team fluency layouts, the percentage of concurrent motion was significantly smaller. And so we see that the behaviors that we observed with even a rough human model in simulation translated when we had actually real users. And so when I was playing with generative adversarial networks, I thought, can we actually use the same to generate video game levels? And in fact, before coming to the States and starting my graduate studies, I worked in Japan for a few years at Square Enix in procedural content generation. And one thing that I very, very quickly found out was that video game designers, like we spent a lot of time like optimizing and getting the content right, and video game designers never use it. But instead, they took that content and for them it was a starting point for exploration. So designers want to have a diverse range of high quality content that they can use to explore. 
And so we ask the question, can we generate diverse video game levels where we have a gun with human authored examples and we train the gun and then we have a Mario, like these are Mario scenes, play the level like an AI agent running an A star algorithm. And then, but then instead of just sampling from the training distribution of the gun, can we, ser can we instead search for levels that are diverse with respect to the number of enemies and number of sky tiles? So some features that we, of diversity that we care about. And so this is an example level resulting that this has a large number of enemies and a small number of sky tiles. This is a large number of enemies and only ground tiles. This is the opposite, so this is uh, only sky tiles and no enemies. And this is somewhere in between. So this has both sky tiles and uh, different, uh, somewhere in between. And these are all the levels are automatically generated from a single run of the quality diversity CMAME searching latent vectors of a tra trained generative adversarial network, trying to find an archive of diverse solutions. So we showed how we can increase a little bit the complexity of the content that we generate. I wanted to come back to the first part, which is can we make, can we further improve the efficiency of searching for diverse solutions? And so all the algorithms that I have described so far assume that you do not make any assumptions about the objective or measures. So they treat them as black boxes. But there are many applications where you can actually have exact gradient information of both the objective and measures. And so this is a differentiable quality diversity problem that we proposed where the objective and measures are first order differentiable. An example application of that is a style gun and clip pipeline. So style gun would generate an image and then you can pass, the, you can pass a text prompt that says Elon Musk with a short hair and then you pass the two on a clip, which is a model tra trained by OpenAI, and that will give you a similarity score. Now, the whole pipeline here is end-to-end -end differentiable. So what you can do is you can actually do gradient ascent to minimize the similarity, or maximize the similarity score, minimize the, the score output of the clip, to get an image that looks like Elon Musk as much as possible. But what if we want to have diverse range of images? So we want to have faces that look like Elon Musk with blue eyes, or with a different hair color. Now, what we could do is we could pass a prompt that says a man with blue eyes, and then the similarity score with that prompt would be the measure of diversity. And so instead of trying to maximize or minimize that, trying to find solutions for an entire range of similarity scores. Solutions where the eye color is uh, blue, but also the eye color is as far away from blue as possible. This would be a measure of diversity and now the measure itself is also end-to-end -end differentiable, right? Because we use exactly the same pipeline. And this is a differentiable quality diversity problem. And this was actually has been an open problem for several years. And we have uh, solved that problem. And we actually presented that as an oral presentation at NeurIPS this year. And so in the next uh, slides, I would like to give you the intuition on how we will solve that problem. So in MapElitz, the way MapElitz works is that we take a solution and then we perturb that solution with some isotropic Gaussian. Can we leverage gradient information in MapElitz? Well, let's see. If we have just one objective and we take the gradient of that objective, then we move in one direction, the direction of steepest ascent, right? But the quality diversity, we have one objective that we want to have the gradient, but we also have measures so we have one objective that we want to maximize, the quality F, but we also have measures that form a measure space that we want to explore. And so how can we leverage gradient information to explore the measure space? Well, let's say assume that we have two measures that form a two-dimensional coordinate system. The gradient of M1 with respect to theta is a direction of steepest ascent of M1. And the gradient of M2 with respect to theta, measure 2, is the direction of steepest ascent with respect to M2. And the negative gradients are the directions of steepest descent. And so we see that these gradients form a coordinate system. And then if we find some coefficients and multiply the gradients with these coefficients, we can perform some motion in that coordinate system. And so if we have one objective that we want to maximize, we can do gradient ascent. Here we have gradients and we want to explore the measure space. So this implies some branching tree structure. 
but there is still a directionality in the search in that we still want to maximize quality. So there is still an objective F that we want to maximize. And so we borrow the term arborescence from graph theory to indicate that this is a directed research. And so in Mapelitz, you could take a solution and then apply some perturbation with an isotropic Gaussian. Here in Mapelitz via gradient arborescence, we can take a function G that is a linear combination of the objective and the measures of diversity that we want to have. Maximizing G results in maximizing the quality F and performing some type of motion in measure space. Now, what type of motion will be that? That will be specified by the coefficients. So we could, the coefficients will specify direction on how we navigate the measure space, but also um, they will specify a step size, how fast we move in measure space. How do we pick these coefficients? Well, one approach would be to just sample them from some multivariate Gaussian. But we, what will actually work much better is to use exactly the same insight that uh, we used in CMAME, where we said, OK, let's search for coefficients that maximize archive improvement. And let's use CMAES to do that. So before we used CMAES, where we're trying to find solutions that maximize archive improvement, here, instead of trying to find solutions, we try to find coefficients where performing a gradient ascent step with respect to each coefficient, with, with respect to the sample coefficients, will move in the direction of maximum archive improvement and therefore will fill in the archive as much as possible. And so this is a covariance matrix adaptation map elites via gradient arborescence algorithm. And the idea is the following. We have a multivariate Gaussian retained by CMAS. This is a Gaussian of coefficients. We sample coefficients from that Gaussian. And then for each sample, we perform a gradient ascent step from an existing solution point. And then we evaluate the solution that results from the gradient ascent step. And we evaluate it based on how much it improves the archive. And therefore, then we pick the best direction that maximizes archive improvement. We also use the same evaluation to rank and select and rank the best coefficients. And then we update that the mean and uh, covariance metrics of the multivariate Gaussian. So to give you an example, let's assume that we are in a 3D search space. So we are, the, the solutions here or the scenarios are like in, in this room. And there is one objective and one measure. So you compute the objective and measure gradients. And this form a two-dimensional coordinate system. So this form, let's say, a sheet. And then within that sheet here, you search for the direction that maximizes archive improvement. And you perform a step in the best possible direction. And then you recompute the objective and measure gradients. And so now the optimization landscape has changed a little bit. But it, we assume it doesn't change very fast. And then you do the same thing iteratively. And we can actually show that if you do that, then we, we, this is the, the arborescence as projected in measure space to see how the arborescence work. But we can actually show that if we do that, we were able for the first time to solve uh, completely some benchmark domains. So you see how the algorithm compares with respect to like CMAME and some state-of-the-art quality diversity algorithms. We also came back to the original application of um, uh, generating diverse images using the style gun and clip pipeline. And so this is a collage of sampled images from the archive of solutions, where as you go down, the hair color becomes um, uh, more and more red. As we go to the left, the eye color becomes blue. And, but the objective is to look like Elon Musk. So we see this diverse range of faces. And these are two cherry-picked examples. We can do the same for uh, Jennifer Lopez, for Beyonce. As we go down, uh, she becomes younger. As we go left, her hair becomes uh, longer. And this is, again, a cherry-picked example. And also, and this is Jennifer Lopez. So as we go down, she starts frowning. As we go left, her hair becomes longer. And all these faces are generated with a single run of CMA Mega, exploring the latent space of the style gun. Now, all these algorithms that I have discussed, we have open sourced them in a library named PyRips. So if you're interested in trying them out, please, by all means. We also have a set of tutorials. Uh, so. We can also, one of the tutorials is use quality diversity strategies to make a lunar lander land like a space shuttle because we come from the space shuttle era. And so uh, I would encourage you to uh, play with some of the tutorials that we have. 
So one, one um, research direction that I have been very excited from the beginning of my graduate studies has been how to learn human preferences. And so when people provide, um, even, even in tasks, in collaborative tasks where there is a near an infinite number of different ways to complete the task, uh, we can actually cluster, we can explode similarities between users and cluster them into groups based on their preference. And so cluster them into dominant types with unsupervised learning so that when a new user comes, they can very, very quickly adapt to the new type or preference. But uh, what uh, we have been very recently uh, so in a more complex uh, task, so in this IKEA assembly task, is that uh, people's preferences exist in multiple resolutions. So people have preferences, for example, on whether to start with assembling the shelves or the boards, but also lower level preferences on how to uh, connect shelves to boards. So exploiting this kind of structure has, hel has helped um, making much more efficient prediction. And we now have uh, been working with um, a mobile uh, robot manipulator and extending this to a much, much more complex uh, model airplane assembly task. And we try to enable a robot to predict the next human action based on their preference and assist the human for this assembly task. And so we have, this is a project funded by NRI and we have got a, a bunch of model airplane, uh, model RC airplanes. And students uh, only use these airplanes for experiments and never fly them around for fun, wink, wink. And when, when having a human demonstrations, many of these demonstrations are suboptimal. And so the question then becomes how we can extract useful information from the suboptimal demonstrations. And so that's a project that we have also been working on. I wanted to, as we go towards the end of the talk, to come back to the shared combing project. So this is something that we have been building and iterating on. And so when things were still back to normal, we had a live demonstration at NeurIPS where Nathan uh, has short hair, so the robot uh, quickly adapts to his uh, hair style, but uh, Yura has a much longer hair and therefore the robot will need to take a very different, uh, uh, a much longer path. And this is also a system that we are currently working on and um, um, trying to make it more robust. So w when it comes to hair combing, like robust human-robot interaction is important because if something goes wrong, then it will hurt a little bit. But in this operation here, this, uh, this is a roof bolting operation inside the mine where the idea is that you use a roof bolter to drill a, a hole on the ceiling of the mine and then put a steel bolt to reinforce the ceiling. And the roof bolter here runs on hydraulics. So if something goes wrong, it typically results in very, very severe uh, accidents, right? Severe injuries. So this is actually a very safety critical application. And one thing that we have been working on in collaboration with the mining engineering department at the University of Kentucky has been how we can remove the human from a danger zone and enable more robust interactions by having the human provide some high level goals while the robot, while an industrial manipulator coordinates with a roof bolter uh, in, in, in this kind of a, a ceiling reinforcement application. So since I started at USC, we also introduced a robotics class. So we have uh, five uh, Kinova arms and we have all the students uh, split into groups and actually apply the uh, whole manipulation and planning pipeline on these uh, Kinova arms. And so last year we did everything in simulation, but this year for the first time we, had the, we were able to do this uh, labs in person, which was uh, uh, quite rewarding. This is a most important slide. So this is all the students that did the work. So Matt Fontaine has been working on uh, Quality diversity optimization, scenario generation for human-robot interaction, and latent space illumination. Sophie Su, Yulun Zhang, and Brian Chanaka have been working on environment generation that results in diverse coordination behaviors. Brian Chanaka has also been leaning the uh, PyRIPS library, the open source library, Herab Nemlekar on learning human preferences in assembly tasks, Anirudh Spuranin on learning preference from suboptimal demonstrations, Nathan Bendler on the hair combing task, and He Jia Zhang on the roof building task. And I'm very, very grateful to all, the, all my collaborators. And so the, the main takeaway that I would like you to have from this talk is that there are many applications that, and one of them is robust human-robot interaction and scenario generation where we want to have a diverse range of high-quality solutions. And so in this talk, we discussed how we can use quality diversity algorithms to search for a diverse range of scenarios that are high quality, but also how integrating these quality diversity algorithms with generative models trained with human authored examples can result in content that is not only complex, but also realistic. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions.
Any questions? Uh, I have a question on the slide you have uh, with CMA, Mega, and CMA ME. Mm -hmm. I think the Mega variation fills the archive really, really quickly compared right. to everything else. Right. Uh, can you give uh, some insights as to why it's able to fill the archive so quickly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the idea here is that CMA ME and all the quality diversity algorithms so far have not made any assumptions about the gradient information. So they are all gradient free algorithms. And so the way they work is they try, so CMA ME, for example, try to estimate the gradient by generating new solutions and evaluating the solutions of how much they improve the archive and then iteratively moving in the direction of gradient with respect to the quality diversity objective. Um, Mapelitz does that by taking existing solutions and then applying some isotropic perturbation, which assumes that every direction is equally likely. This is because Mapelitz uh, itself was designed to run for a long period of time, so they, it, it is designed not to have any bias in any direction. Uh, and Mapelitz line is a variant of Mapelitz, the other baseline, that has some um, um, that has a different operator. So instead of a, a, applying an isotropic Gaussian. Uh, as noise, it exploits some local correlations to move in a, in a given direction. CMA Mega, what it does is it, it assumes and it, it leverages exact gradient information. So we analytically, so this was like a sphere domain, which is a, a benchmark domain where we analytically compute the gradients. And these gradients specify a space, an objective and measure space, that we can then navigate. And then the question becomes, how do you navigate that space? And then we use CMAS, but um, we use CMAS on the coefficients. Another way to think of that is that we essentially reduce, reduce the search from a high dimensional space of parameters to a much lower dimensional space of coefficients, where we directly use these coefficients and this kind of measuring objective gradients to navigate that space. Any other questions? Following that question, um, do you have any intuition about how uh, it sort of balances the coefficients on the objective cost f versus the measures? So, like, is it yes. basically choosing a strategy where it first exploits an f and right. then explores an m, or maybe vice versa? Right. That's a great question, right? So, how do you pick these coefficients? And the answer is, we let CMA yes decide that. And so the, what happens is that CMAS, Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolution Strategy, samples different coefficients, where different coefficient vectors, right? The, where it's, its element of the vector, like the first element corresponds to the objective, the next corresponds to the measures, right? So it samples some of them. And then it performs a gradient ascent step and evaluates how the resulting solution, how much the resulting solution improves the archive. And then it assigns some weights based on this evaluation. So it ranks these resulting solutions. And then based on these rankings, it adapts the weights and moves the mean and, uh, of, of the distribution, right, and the covariance metrics, and does this iteratively. And therefore, because it uses this ranking and because it has some very, very nice step size adaptation properties, which are analogous to, the, to, 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 a, to a momentum in a stochastic gradient ascent, right? Uh, it, it is able to find out exactly how it needs to navigate the objective and measure space to maximize archive improvement. So it, it, it changes the coefficients in a direction of filling the archive. Right, right. I'm more asking, like, intuitively, like if you were to plot uh, C naught I see. over iterations, I see. do you see any of the, uh, so like, is it, Depending on your problem? Right, yeah, it's problem dependent because, and it also depends on the scale of the objective and measures. One other thing that uh, I didn't mention that is more in implementation detail is that we normalize all these measure and objective gradients and so that they are all on the same scale, but then how fast you should move in each direction depends on whether, how much the speed in each direction uh, helps fill in the archive. But it's problem dependent, right? And CMAES will, uh, will, will, will let CMAES uh, find the, the right scale of these coefficients, and, and also the sign. Okay. More questions? Also, if you are on Zoom, you can also unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. Okay, 
So if there are no further questions, then thank you again, Stefano, yeah, for your great talk. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I see you next week then. Thank you. Thanks.